Thank you so much, Anthony. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I thank all of you who are participating. Um, so I'm gonna give a summary. Um, I'll have to go through it kind of fast, but hopefully you can get some ideas from it. My book is a story of the history of civilization as the interplay of two great ideas. One is the idea that the human mind can grasp the universe, meaning everything. And the other is the idea that the human mind can grasp itself. And I argue that although both ideas have always existed, the first idea dominated in the West for thousands of years, all the way up to the early modern period, when in the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a big switch. And the idea that the human mind can grasp itself rose to dominance and that changed everything in philosophy, in art, in literature, in science, and in moral and political thought. When the first great idea dominated, people thought that they grasped their minds through their grasp of the world. Human minds are part of the world. And to understand one's mind meant understanding the place of one's mind in the social and natural world or the world created by God. Morality in this period was thought to be built into nature. Um, it, people thought that living a good life was living in accordance with one's nature, which is part of nature as a whole. And the dominant value was harmony with the world around us. And we see the same idea in the art and the literature of the pre-modern period. What we express in art was not thought to be individuality, either the individuality of the artist or the individuality of the subject. Instead, uh, we express a common vision um, in which our place in the world is not determined by us, but it's something we've inherited and it's been determined by God or by nature. And you see that good examples of that would be Byzantine icons and medieval cathedrals, which I discuss in the book. And this also affected the way people thought of human dignity. Human dignity comes from being a person, where a person is a creature with a high standing in the universe. Uh, we see that all the way back to ancient Roman law and the way the idea of persona was used. So our dignity comes from being a creature of a certain kind, a rational being that has a high standing in the universe. Now, in the early modern period in the West, there was a dramatic change. And this change, as far as I can tell, did not occur in other parts of the world. The second great idea rose to dominance and became more important and more basic than the first. So whereas formerly people thought that we grasp the world before our minds, now they thought that we grasp our mind before the world. Um, philosophers, starting with Descartes, argued that we first grasp our mind and then try to figure out what the world outside our minds is like from the representations in our mind. Uh, and you see the same thing in the British empiricists. Um, we grasp our mind first and the world is, is interpreted by the ideas that we have in our mind. Now, what brought about the rise of the second great, great idea was partly historical events and partly philosophy. Um, Historical events like the Reformation and the scientific revolution undermined people's trust in the version of the first great idea that everyone had accepted, the Christian version of the first great idea. But more importantly than that, there was the discovery of subjectivity. And what I mean by subjectivity is your, the unique world of your own conscious experience. Um, that was thought eventually to be valuable, not just because of what we have in common. I mean, we are valuable, not just because of what we have in common with other persons, but for what makes us unique. And dignity then took on another meaning as the value of the uniqueness and the irreplaceability of persons, not the value of their common rational nature. Um, now, I think the shift uh, in the rise of, this, of the second great idea started first in art and literature before it started in, in philosophy and political thought. One of the earliest changes 
was the Arab discovery of perspective, which was brought to Florence in the 15th century. And that of course led to the artistic explosion of the Renaissance. Perspective not only made artworks more realistic, but they enabled the artist to portray an individual point of view, an consciously chosen perspective. And at this time, it became much more common for artworks to be signed. Previously, it would have been thought arrogant to sign artworks. Um, but the fact that the artwork expressed an individual personality and that the artwork of one artist differed significantly from others was thought to be important. Um, there was also a revolution in literature with the invention of the modern novel. In the novel, we get to follow the consciousness of the characters as they go through their imaginary lives. That's quite the opposite of what Aristotle said in the Poetics where he wrote, as I interpret it, that characters are universals with proper names attached. And Aristotle also says that the characters exist for the sake of the action. And the action expresses relationships of cause and effect between one kind of act and another, another consequence, which could happen to anybody. They're not unique to the individual character. Um, but in the novel, the action is often not as interesting or important as what is going on in the character's head. And modern fictional characters are clearly singular individuals with unique personalities. Um, some people have written that this was a radical change in consciousness that partly explains what makes modern consciousness so different from what came before. Moral and political thought changed at the same time. I said that the pre-modern ideal was harmony, harmony with the world around us. Uh, but suppose you start with your own mind and you think you have to figure out what the world outside your mind is like from the ideas in your mind. That leads you to be aware of the fact that you direct your thoughts and your actions yourself you come first. Um, and that led within a fairly short time to the idea that the ultimate ground of morality and is, is autonomy in the sense of self-governance. And autonomy in that sense of self-governance became the, um, the basic value in both uh, moral and political thought. So what should we say about the two great ideas? The ideas themselves don't conflict and I don't see any conflict between them in non-Western cultures. But in the West, the form these ideas took was in conflict. So the idea that my grasp of my mind is more basic than my grasp of the universe or the world around me conflicts with the idea that my grasp of the world is more basic than my grasp of my mind. So we have inherited this conflict um, and it has left us with both theoretical and practical problems. Um, the theoretical problem is that we have not figured out, I think, how to understand the relationship between our own subjective world, the world of our minds, and the objective world, which is presumably the same for everybody. The practical problem is that we've inherited two fundamentally different moral values that at least have been interpreted in ways that conflict. The value of harmony, uh, which comes from the first great idea, and the value of autonomy, which comes from the second great idea. And I think the these values clash in debates about a, many political issues. Um, once you get past the unhelpful um, emotional verbiage in the way people debate political issues, I think you'll find the clash between autonomy and harmony underlies debates about abortion, the environment, responses to COVID, gay marriage, free speech, and many other issues. So what should we do? Um, 
I propose that we will not make much headway unless a third idea rises to the level of importance of the other two, the idea that the human mind can grasp other minds. When you think about the two great ideas together, you'll notice an obvious gap. Uh, we grasp the world and we grasp our own minds, but surely we can also grasp other minds. Um, you and I can exchange our subjective experiences and understand what it's like to have lived those experiences. We do that all the time. Um, and I think we're all well practiced in inner subjectivity. But unfortunately, the idea of inner subjectivity has never been given sufficient attention in Western thought. Although the phenomenologists have attempted to do so and going back to more than hundred years ago in the work of Husserl. So what I think we need is a revolution in the study of subjectivity and inner subjectivity comparable in scope to the scientific revolution in the study of the objective world. Um, inner subjectivity has been studied in a number of different fields in neurobiology, um, with the discovery of mirror, neur mirror neurons, uh, in psychology and education theory, with lots of studies on empathy. Phenomenology um, uh, seems to be getting more attention now than it has for decades, um, and literary studies. But this work is still disconnected and has not resulted in a comprehensive systematic account of inner subjectivity on the level of the interconnected natural sciences. So I think that if we could have a comprehensive understanding of inner subjectivity, that would help us bridge our understanding of our own minds with our understanding of the world without minds and I think it could also have the practical benefit of helping us connect the value of harmony, which we got from the first great idea, with the value of autonomy, which we got from the second. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Well, that was um, that was um, a very comprehensive overview. I, I guess um, my role now will be to ask a few more. Um, specific questions, picking up on some of the things you said, and then opening up in about 20 minutes to questions from the audience, which I encourage you to start sending in whenever. I mean, um, the first question that I wanted to put to you was about um, whether you see these ideas hierarchically. Do you, do you think that the first great idea is better than the second, more important, more fundamental, or do you see them as... Um, not, not in that hierarchical sense? That's a really good question. Um, the first great idea has been around a lot longer and has a lot longer history than uh, not only in the West, but in other parts of the world. But I think that we're never going back to the dis uh, from the discovery of subjectivity. The discovery of subjectivity is what brought the second great idea to the forefront of consciousness in the West. And uh, we would never want to give that up, or, you know, leave it aside. Um, it's because of the discovery of subjectivity that we um, value individual differences. It's been responsible, I think, for the greater respect that disabled people get. And I think it has been, historically at least, it was closely associated with the rise of the idea of, of human rights, individual rights that we bear, not just because we're all you know, in the same species, but because we have as individuals a special dignity. So I would never want to see the second great idea go away. Um, and I, I suspect that there ought to be a way to combine them without making one more important than the other. And my suggestion is to try out a completely different approach where neither idea is, neither, neither of those two ideas is the basic one, but we give the idea of intersubjectivity a chance 
to dominate human culture for a while, if it can be done, to see how the other two ideas shake out. Okay, so an another way I wanted to sort of frame the relationship between the two great ideas, you touched on the differing ways in which they have related in Western and non-Western traditions. Mm -hmm. And although you're not trying to give a in-depth account of non-Western traditions, you do touch upon them. And I was wondering if you could say anything about the important ways in which the um, these two ideas have, I mean, um, have they been mm -hmm. more harmonious in non-Western sure. traditions than yeah. in Western ones? Or how, how has it sort of played out differently? Well, I um, hesitate to say anything um, about something I don't know a whole lot about. But while I was writing the book, I was reading the Hindu Upanishads and I've actually been reading them again re in the last few days. And I am just gripped by the idea that the, the, the self with a capital S is the same in everybody and or Atman and that that's actually identical with Brahman. And there's a way to look at that or to read that where it turns out that the two great ideas are the same thing. Mm. Or, you know, it's in some way they're the same thing. Um, and I don't, uh, as I said, I'm not an expert on this. I have to be careful what I say about it. But um, I, I, I find this really interesting to explore. And I hope that other people will certainly do that too. Well, so certainly, I mean, in, in an area where you, you have more sort of expertise, the mm -hmm. history of Western religious thought, you, you highlight the value of um, the kind of striving for unity or oneness within mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, someone like yeah. Plot Plotinus yeah. comes to mind as someone yeah. you're, you, you kind of focus on quite a lot. Is, is the idea of unity or oneness an idea primarily rooted in the first idea, or is it, as you were saying with the Upanishad, something about the bringing together of the first and second idea into a harmonious whole? Well, the idea that we can, that grasping the universe, it takes the form of uniting with the universe, the one, the Tao, Brahman, you know, whatever it is, that idea is, is ubiquitous throughout cultures that were dominated by the first great idea and seems to have kind of faded away, shall we say, in the era dominated by the second great idea. Um, uh, so I'm not sure exactly how to answer the question. Um, as I said, there might be a way of interpreting the ideas where they end up to be the same thing on some deep level. But I do associate the idea of, of, of uniting, not just grasp, grasping, but uniting with the whole as driven by the first great idea. Okay, that, that's great. I mean, a, a distinction you make quite early on in the book is between personal thought and, and speculative thought. And I guess if we were talking about a distinction maybe between religious thought rooted in the first great idea and perhaps more scientific thought rooted in the second great idea. I was wondering, um, you, you talk early on in the book about mythical or mythopoeic thinking, and you, you mm -hmm. say this is a personal form of thinking and you contrast it with say mathematical or metaphysical thought, which you call mm -hmm. speculative. Is it the case that um, speculative thought captures the the great ideas better than mythopoeic thought, or is it just different? And if so, how how are the two different in the ways in which they engage? Um, like, for that, example, I suppose yeah, the question would yeah. be: Has myth mythopoeic thought generated the second great idea, or is that only connected with the first great idea? Well, in the book. I described mythopoeic thought as preceding ancient Greek thought. Um, uh, if you look at a very old book by the Frankfurts um, 
called before uh, before philosophy, I think it's called. Um, they describe mythopoeic thought as the dominant thought of the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians, and they contrast it with speculative thought as, as we see in the ancient Greeks. Mythopoeic thought was, it isn't just myths or mythology, but it's, a, it's seeing the world, the whole world in personal conscious terms. So the Nile decides to rise, you know, the sun decides to set, I guess. Um, and um, their concepts of space and time, cause and effect, you know, all these concepts were uh, understood in, as personal concepts. And in the book, I was a little bit ambivalent about whether mythopoeic thought counts as a version of the first great idea. Um, and when you get to the ancient Greeks, when you get to Thales and the, the pre-Socratic philosophers in the sixth century BC, it's very obvious they have the first great idea. I mean, they're quite consciously trying to identify uh, the foundation of the whole universe. And their kind of thinking is not personal. It's uh, the concepts are impersonal, abstract, that led to the ability to systematize different fields of thought. And then, you know, with the ancient Greeks, you get systematic mathematics, you get systematic ethics for, you know, I mean, you get systematic everything. Um, I now think that mythopoeic thought was a version of the first great idea because it doesn't mean every myth is a version of the first great idea, but if you tell a narrative about the origin of the universe and where humans belong in it and what ultimate destiny is, that is a version of the first great idea. It's an attempt to give an account of everything in a way that has a coherent structure. It's a narrative structure, which is different than, quite obviously different than scientific structure, systematic scientific structure, but it is a structure. I don't, what I don't see is that um, mythopoeic thought has anything much to do with the second great idea. I mean, at least yeah. that's the way I was thinking of it. Um, I mean, we still like narratives. Everybody likes stories. And so there's, in some way, we still tell stories um, but our stories tend to be more focused. I don't know to what extent, um, I mean, well, in Genesis, you have a story about the origin of the universe. So, I mean, we still have stories, but we also still have what we inherited from the Greeks. Yeah, Spec I mean, it, it may be tempting to think um, of the distinction you draw between personal thinking and speculative thinking as a distinction between a kind of enchanted form of thinking and a kind of disenchanted form. Oh, of thinking. yes, you could. Yes, yes. But it seems in the context of the book that you only really address the question of disenchantment in or around the turn of the 20th century. So was it possible within, for example, a framework that thought that the world was fundamentally made up of numbers, which sounds terribly cold and abstract still to maintain a sense of the say divinity of nature or the, the kind yes, of- Yes, that's a really good point. Mm. Yeah, if anybody who reads the book will see that I'm fascinated with Pythagoreanism. I mean, I just love Pythagoras and the <laughs> later Pythagoreans. Um, I mean, as far as I can tell, nobody has ever, ever <laughs> uh, matched them and their ability to connect every branch of knowledge in a human activity, including religion. So in thinking that the world is composed of numbers or in a weaker version, it's composed of forms that can be numerically expressed. That's just genius. I mean, they were able to connect metaphysics with mathematics, with, the, um, with, with musical harmony, which is mathematical, with the, uh, astronomy, uh, they thought that the laws of harmony applied to the human body and could be used in 
in healing for, by physicians and healing. Uh, harmony belongs, uh, laws of harmony belong in the human soul and in the state. And that came before Plato wrote his Republic, which had that same idea. So they managed to get everything together and uh, beauty is harmonic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's expressed numerically. That's just fabulous. I love it. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a very kind of broad question. I doubt if there's a, a clean cut answer, but where does the disenchantment that you pick up on in thinkers like say Max Weber set in? Because you'd imagine that it could have come with the turn from mythopaic thinking to speculative thinking, but obviously in your account that seemed to sustain a very harmonious view of the universe mm -hmm. for um, millennia still. So wh where, where would you say the seeds of the disenchantment is yeah. sown? So uh, one thing I didn't say in my summary was that um, even though the second great idea, I think is responsible for, for um, the, um, the philosophies that were created to give a foundation to empirical science. Um, even though the second great idea did that, ironically, at some point, the product of scientific investigation was then interpreted by many people as giving the um, an adequate uh, account of the first great idea. In other words, we could get an idea of the world as a whole from science, from empirical science. And that actually is the disenchantment, I think. Um, it isn't that science, empirical science and religion conflict. They don't actually conflict in themselves, but the idea that science could give us a theory of everything does conflict with versions of the first great idea that give people a sense of meaning or belonging in the world. I mean, you see this, you know, when, when Thomas Nagel wrote in his essay, uh, what's it called again, Secular Philosophy and the Religious Temperament, he, he bemoans the fact that secular philosophy and science have lost the sense um, of giving people a, a meaning in their lives where they connect. Each individual person has a sense of connection with the world as a whole. Science doesn't give you that. And for people who have what he calls the religious temperament, um, they want another kind of account of what I'm calling the first great idea where they do feel, have this connection. Um, so that's, I think, where the disenchantment is. It's the sense of losing a sense of being part of it. Okay, th thank you. So um, one of the, the, the sort of historical arc, I suppose, of your story is something like, you start with the first great idea, that comes under some degree of attack the, with Descartes, especially. Um, and then if you like solidified with Kant and others, we have the rise of the second great idea, but then in the 20th century with um, people like Freud, um, who would question the extent to which if the second great idea is based on knowing our own mind, he questions- We don't do a very good job of it. <laughs> so the, the yeah. quote that I picked up on is, we are left with a great deal of skepticism about our ability to grasp either ourselves or the universe. And that is very bad for our ability to live lives that allow us to develop our human cognitive and social gifts to the full. So I was hoping you could say something about that diagnosis of our times as the sort of yes, thanks for the that failure question. of the two yeah. ideas. Yeah, um, so my idea was that both of these two great ideas invigorated civilization. Uh, I mean, the first great idea for millennia and drove civilization for millennia and the second great idea for, you know, 500 years, say. And these ideas really have produced um, enormously important cultural products. And 
once we start losing confidence in them, uh, so I think civilization itself is is in the you know in a state of confusion and possibly decline. Um, I'm more kind of an optimistic person, so I don't want to say it's really in decline, but uh, it could be, um, and um, that's why I'm looking for uh, you know holding out the hope that there will be a third great idea that will also be able to invigorate civilization. And so, you know, we saw what civilization was like when it was dominated by the first great idea. And we have seen what civilization was like when it was dominated by the second. So now I say, well, let's give the third idea, the idea of intersubjectivity that we can grasp by their minds. Let's give that a chance. Mm. And that might, uh, not only help our intellectual confusions, but it might actually help us with our practical and political problems. Yeah, um, well, before turning to the um, q and I can already see a, a, a buildup of, of quite a lot of questions <laughs> at, a, at quite an early stage. I mean, there's so much more. I mean, I, I said to you before we started the event, we'll never get through a fraction of the questions. And obviously, that, so, yeah, so much funny. I wanted to speak to you about that I, I, I won't be able to. But I suppose I just wanted to bring in the area which I guess I initially knew you um, for is, is virtue. What, what's the status of virtue in relation to the rise of the, the second great idea? OK, so um, virtue was an important concept when the first great idea dominated because virtues are qualities that we need to live in harmony with the world, the social, primarily the social world. Um, so virtues enable us to flourish both as individuals and as a community. With the rise of the second great idea, virtue discourse faded away and was replaced by the idea that morality is based on human, individual human rights. Um, so we can thank the second great idea for the idea of rights, which is, as far as I can tell, the best idea human beings have ever come up with to try and combat oppression. But the problem with making all of morality reduced to rights is that all of the virtues of harmonious human societies get pushed in the background and get no attention. There are many virtues that really have nothing to do with people's rights. Humility, civility, uh, compassion. I mean, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Aristotle's virtues. Um, those virtues even include things like the proper handling of your money, you know, mm -hmm. a generosity, of course. So these virtues, um, you know, kind of faded away. And you can see this in debates about free speech, where, you know, if they're only the only issue is one person's right to say what they want and somebody else's right not to be offended, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, what happened to civility, the virtue of getting along with people, um, showing respect in your in your behavior, but it's not a matter of rights. So um, that I think is kind of the current situation. However, um, virtue discourse is coming back slowly, but it is coming back. I mean, I've written on virtues, other people have written on virtues. So it's, it is, uh, you know, making headway, I guess some headway, but um, that I think it's, 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 it's an, it's an uphill battle because rights talk still dominates public mm. discourse. Okay. So I think we'll turn now to the, the Q and A. Um, something that popped up in the in the chat i i can't necessarily read all of it because i'm not very good at scrolling up and down on the chat but it, it's it's a kind of ideal transition question because it picks up on um what we were just talking about and it's from ali leonard hello ali um back in the times when these were face-to-face -face events at the Lytton Phil in newcastle ali was one of the people who would always come along so it's great that you're still um joining so ali questions the the 
um, relationship between harmony and autonomy with current political issues and asks whether or not they align with the political spectrum? Is there a sense in which the right they don't. values? Okay. Yeah, so, in fact, I say that explicitly in the book. I actually have an op-ed piece about this too, that um, they don't, they do not line up with the political spectrum. And insisting that we're all either left or right just confuses matters. So examples would be, I mean, take the idea that autonomy means I have the right to decide what happens in and to my body. Okay, that's been used to defend abortion. It's also been used to defend the right to refuse COVID vaccines. You know, one's associated with liberals, the other one's associated with conservatives. Um, Autonomy has also been used as an argument to defend gun rights, uh, and it's been used to defend gay marriage, again, different sides of the political spectrum. So um, I think that the autonomy versus harmony um, conflict or clash does, definitely does not line up with the uh, you know, left versus right or conservative versus liberal. And uh, it would help if we could, you know, get past those political categories. Okay, thank you, Linda. So um, the next question is from Carsten, who asks, how does Augustine, who certainly had a sense of the importance of subjectivity, fit into your narrative? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I, I do talk about Augustine um, in the book in several places. Um, so I think the standard reading of Augustine's confessions is that he was, you know, a thousand years before his time. And he... Um, Sorry, Linda, I think you need to just speak a little bit closer to the mic. You've suddenly oh, I'm gone. sorry. There you go. Yeah. We're back. Yes. Okay. So um, I think the idea is that he was, you know, he stood out for the fact that his philosophy in the confessions derived from his ref uh, conscious self-reflections, his subjective ex uh, experience. Um, and I don't have any objections to that. Um, I mean, Maybe he really was a man a thousand years before his time. Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning that Bakhtin actually interprets him as not an exception. He claims that Augustine's confessions needs to be declaimed aloud. You know, it's written to be said to somebody else. Um, I'm not. I don't have any particular reaction to that. Um, I can go either way, but I'm, I think that it's, it's, I don't see any objections at all to saying he was an exception. Okay, thank you. So there's a couple of questions that have come in about intersubjectivity, which is great because that's obviously the third yeah. great idea and we didn't have time to get to yeah. it in. Um, in our conversation. So this is from Adriana from Mexico City. So Adriana asks, isn't it the case that we do have a sort of systematic study of intersubjectivity that aims at harmony in the work of say Adam Smith? One can perhaps agree with him or not, but would you see in him an attempt to combine subjectivity and harmony? Oh my goodness, I never thought of that. I think I would like to hear her say more about this. How would Adam Smith combine inner subjectivity with harmony? Was that the claim? Yeah, I mean, it, well, it seems to be combining subjectivity with harmony. And I, I think that Adriana is saying, is that not essentially a, a study of- um, Oh, okay, I don't know. I, I, I only, I'm gonna have to say, I need to go and look at that again. It could be. Um, I don't, uh, I had not thought of that when I wrote the book and I hadn't thought of that until this minute. So, okay, well, Adriana, if you want to yeah. follow up with a comment, I will turn to it as soon as it um, arrives. Yeah, sure. If you have a more specific question you want to touch on. So Francis um, writes that, 
although Wittgenstein did not write about the two great ideas, he did dissolve the problem of other minds. And, and this is interesting because you talked about phenomenology in Edmund Husserl. Mm. And I guess when they're talking about intersubjectivity, they're not really starting from the problem of other minds understood as a kind of a skeptical issue. So that's a really useful way, I think, mm -hmm. of teasing out the relationship between what you call intersubjectivity and what's typically called the problem of other minds in mm -hmm. philosophy, yes. which obviously Wittgenstein yes. has worked very yes. hard to try and um, right. dismiss. Right. Um, yes, I've always been kind of taken by Wittgenstein's argument that there cannot be a private language. I mean, I, I really think that reflection on language can tell us a lot about the relationship between our mind and other minds. Um, so, um, I mean, our reflection on our own minds is done in terms, even in our own heads, we do it by using public language, language we learn from other people. And um, according to Husserl also, the same point applies to reflection on a common world, the objective world. We, we do those, that reflection by using language that we've learned from other people. Other people and the language we learn from them is both the medium for reflection on our minds and the medium for reflection on the world. Now that's going a little farther there, you know, it's going a slightly different direction than Wittgenstein, but that's, that was, that I find very illuminating. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Joanna and Joanna um, asks in the introduction, you talked about um, generating a systematic account of intersubjectivity and her question is, how would this, effectively what she's saying is, how would this be possible given that intersubjectivity is by nature quite a chaotic process? It's a kind of a fluid um, meeting of people and minds in a way that is very difficult to systematize. So, so how, I think she's asking, how would your yeah. vision um, be realizable? Yeah, and uh, that's true. Um, intersubjective exchanges are fluid. They, uh, they seem to resist systematization. Another reason that really worries me about the problems with systematizing intersubjectivity is that if I'm right that each person's subjective world is unique, you know, there's something different about it. Um, that in itself means that you can't have a science in the same sense as a, as a science of the objective world. I mean, the reason we can have a science of the objective world is because of generality. There are laws about repeatable events. It's the generality, the commonality in the natural world that permits it to be systematized. But that's exactly what subjectivity lacks is, I mean, I'm not saying there's no commonality between your mind and mine, but what makes it particularly interesting and important is the ways in which our minds differ from each other, mm. not the ways they're alike. How do you systematize uniqueness? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. So I, 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 I don't know. So, so, so your, <laughs> your proposal is more of a challenge to philosophers yeah. than a than a kind of roadmap for how it may yeah. be achieved. Yeah. Okay. So, so Adriana has got back to us in relation to Adam Smith, and actually okay. the point she makes is is very interesting because one of the um, kind of cornerstones of intersubjectivity that you talk about is is empathy, and Adriana says in or I mean specifically in terms of Adam Smith she's talking about sympathy um, as entering into um, the position of the of others the impartial spectator is that effort to approach others feelings as starting from subjectivity and aiming at harmony so so I, I think she's saying is there not a, a, a model of into subjectivity as rooted in sympathy or empathy with the aim of achieving 
harmony in someone like Adam Smith. I see. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. I mean, that sounds really interesting and I'd like to pursue it. But um, I do think of sympathy and empathy as two different things. Um, what I mean by empathy is actually sort of seeing through somebody else's eyes, feeling with them. Um, you know, it's, it's what you do when you're watching a really good movie or talking in intimate conversation with somebody. You're kind of like you're in their head um, and you're kind of experiencing with them what they're going through. Um, now, I'm not sure if that's what Adam Smith was doing, but sympathy in my vocabulary is more like um, feeling common humanity. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, fe it's feeling um, a kind of, um, how else shall I say it? Underlying preexistent sense of, of being like somebody. Um, and you don't, so it's not necessarily, it doesn't go as far as sort of being in their head. You just have a, a sense in advance that's not neutral, but is more pro the other person. Now, I don't know uh, how that works out in Adam Smith. I, I just would have to have somebody else, you know, tell me how to go about that. Okay, thank you, Linda. So the next question is from Ruhi. And Ruhi asks, um, what are the Western concepts of subjectivity as compared to other philosophies, Chinese, ancient Persian philosophers, etc.? So I, I imagine that you will plead some degree of ignorance or humility vis-a-vis -vis, um, Persian or Chinese conceptions of subjectivity, but I suppose the the core of the question is what are the Western conceptions of subjectivity that you focus on and how may they be distinct from non-Western traditions? No, that's, that's hard. Um, the conceptions of subjectivity. So um, um, I mean, the way I approach subjectivity in the book is to start with art and literature where I'm not sure there is a conception. It's an experience that's able to be expressed in, a, in an artistic form. Um, Descartes, I don't think, did have a concept of subjectivity, to be honest. I mean, he had a concept of starting with his mind and in the individual mind. But the idea of the uniqueness of minds, I don't think he actually had that. So it must have evolved gradually. Um, and um, uh, I think in the book, I'd have to go back and look at what I was reading at the time. Um, there was, I mean, I discussed post-Kantian ideas of the self. And um, the idea of the self and subjectivity that we get in Fichte, might be one of the first ones. Um, but I don't know how to say what the conception is, but it seems to put subjectivity at the foundation of philosophical investigation. Um, then, but the idea of subjectivity as being the ground for dignity, that's maybe later. I mean, you see that the idea that subjectivity is the ground for human dignity, the irreplaceability of the person, um, if anybody can give me ideas, I'd be happy to see that. We certainly see it in the early 20th century personalists, but uh, whether it's before that, I don't know. So there, I guess I see subjectivity as sort of evolving in a certain order in the West. And I really don't think I'm able to say more about that and not in comparison with uh, Asian philosophies. Okay, thank you. So this may have to be the last question. We may have time okay. for another um, small, but this is, this is quite a big question from Kurt. Um, so Kurt asks, um, the impression I get these days is that ideas like the two great ideas are often in conflict in Western society 
Um, so what is contributing to this conflict? So I guess we've touched upon whether or not the ideas have to be in conflict, and you're saying they're not. Um, but on the other hand, you have, as, as I read your narrative, I kind of agree with Kurt that it is a narrative of increasing conflict between the two, or so almost an irreconcilability. So what do you think is contributing to that conflict, at least within our societies? Well, um, just to back up a step, um, I think that um, just the way, the, the form that the two great ideas took in the West does seem to conflict. You know, I know my mind first and then the world conflicts with I know the world first and then my mind. Um, but I mean, and both are in our history. So to the extent that they can, are interpreted in a way that conflict, we've inherited both. So they conflict not just in the culture, but probably in us as individuals. But I think you're asking what's made it worse. Is that right? I mean, like, well, how is it, why is it getting worse and worse? Yeah, how, um, what's the sort of root of the conflict? And yeah, why may it be a specifically Western thing? Yeah, so I mean, I do think the history of the way the ideas developed in the West shows that the conflict was is, is kind of deep. It's in there in a deep way historically. But have we exaggerated and made it worse? I'm sure we have because we live in a society where, I don't know, conflict seems to rule, you know, and, and it's, it's, there isn't even an attempt to avoid conflict. It's almost like people want the conflict. Um, uh, so, I don't know how to express this exactly, except that all kinds of things like social media make conflict more likely, partly because you, everything you say has to be simplified and very fast. And it just, and then when you add the emotions of hostility that underlie people anyway, then it just gets worse and worse and worse. Mm. So, um, I guess I don't have anything else more interesting to say about that, but that's my thought, that mm. there's something about contemporary culture that fosters conflict. It's almost as if people enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Linda, you said earlier that you're, you're an optimist, and I certainly don't want to end the evening on the, the topic of mm -hmm. conflict. And in fact, thinking back to chapter six, your chapter about the future, there is a an optimism, which, as I recall, is partly rooted in Heidegger's idea of being brought up into a oh, yeah. world That's long right. before yeah. we become subjects. Mm -hmm. and, and there is an optimism inherent in your account that says there may be a lot of conflict, but it's not that difficult to get underneath the conflict. There is a lot of commonality that we, we share. And I think that's part of the um, picture of insubjectivity that you want to build up that we're not talking to each other in the third person you know just talking about facts mm -hmm. or we're not just talking about our own experiences but we're also addressing each other as as you in the second person addressing people um, exchanging building up trust so I kind of wanted to emphasize the the positive yes, message yes. in your book even though conflict is definitely part of the um, account so I thought we'd just add with a quick question for my own interest yeah. is that do you, you you've sort of said that the two great ideas are not to be um, understood hierarchically but do you have a preference for the first over the second or the second over the first and if so why um well i mean many people who read my, you know, read this manuscript seem to think I have a preference for the first, but I actually didn't think I did. <laughs> so um, I don't, I, I mean, the, basically I think, I think I said this earlier in answer to another question that the first idea has lasted a whole lot longer than the second idea. So that gives it a leg up in a sense. And it, um, but I don't think we're ever going to go back on the discovery of subjectivity. That is a given. We would never want to give that up. So 
that is something that, I mean, the first great idea is not going anywhere unless it includes subjectivity in it. 